From its beginning, the purpose of the John Seeley Brown Symposium has been to bring leading thinkers to our campus to talk to us about the effects of information technology on transforming society. Over the past several years, we've presented a wide variety of internationally known scholars and practitioners who have spoken on topics ranging from the internet's effect on how we know what we know, to changing notions of literacy, to the role of libraries in the inter internet world. In the commemorative booklet that we prepared and handed out to you as you arrived today, we've listed the past speakers, and if you take a look, you will see that they are, represent the A-list. We're very proud of the people who have come to share their knowledge with us. You'll also find the booklet opens with a tribute to the founder of the symposium, John Seeley Brown. It was John's vision, as well as his generous gift, that enabled us to create and continue this annual lecture series. You can read about his distinguished career, his many awards, which include six honorary degrees, his, the boards on which he serves, including, I'm very pleased to say, our external advisory board. But I believe the position that he's most fond of is one he created himself, the chief of confusion. That's how JSB describes his role in helping people to ask the right questions, because question answering is essential in an ever-changing world. His own questing disposition is reflected in the many roles that he has and continues to play as scientist, artist, engineer, speaker, author, educator, pundit, advisor, and philanthropist. We are eternally grateful to JSB for his interest in and sponsorship of the School of Information. Thank you so much, John. Now I have the great pleasure of introducing to you this year's speaker, Mimi Ito. Mimi is professor in residence at the University of California, Irvine, with appointments in the University of California Humanities Research Institute, the Department of Anthropology, and the Department of Informatics. In addition, she's a visiting associate professor at Keio University Graduate School of Media and Governance. Mimi's a writer, an anthropologist, and a connoisseur of geek culture and learning. Her many interests are evidenced by the variety of blogs and websites she cre has created and maintains or contributes to. Some of them are affiliated with her projects, such as the Connected Learning TV, the Digital Media and Learning Central, the Digital Youth Project, and the Connected Learning Research Network. Others are more personal, such as Multicultural Japan and Bento Blog, which is a fascinating blog that Mimi maintains a photo blog of the absolutely beautiful bento boxes she prepares as her children's meals. I've also learned that Mimi has taken up another interest. I don't think she has a blog yet, and I hope she doesn't mind me mentioning it. It's a little more personal, but she's become an avid surfer. Her main professional interest is in the use of media technology, and especially how young people use media. She's explored the ways in which digital media are changing relationships, identities, and communities. She co-edited Personal, Portable, Pedestrian, Mobile Phones in Japanese Life. In 2006, she received a MacArthur Foundation grant to study youth-initiated engagement with new media to get a sense of how children are really using new media. This work led to the digital, meeting, sorry, digital media and learning hub and the publication so far of two books, Hanging Out, Messing Around, and Geeking Out, and also Engineering Play, a cultural history of children's software. Her most recent book is Fandom Unbound, Otaku Culture in a Connected World. It's a collection of essays on how geek fan culture in Japan creates its own content, alternative marketplaces, and influences. Mimi Ito received her undergraduate degree from Harvard, and she has the rather remarkable accomplishment of having received two separate PhDs from Stanford, one in anthropology and another one in education. As a leading authority in social network technologies and how they shape society, it was a natural to invite Mimi Ito to be the speaker at this year's John Seeley Brown Symposium on Technology and Society, and I ask you to join me in warmly welcoming her. <laughs> 
Well, it's such a pleasure to be here uh, today with you all, especially the day after a historic election, and I got to hear jubilation on campus outside uh, the window of the campus in, so I'm really glad to see some turnout here for this event as well. Uh, and I'm particularly uh, happy to uh, be here in a series that is honoring uh, my mentor, uh, John Seely Brown, who's been a huge influence in my intellectual uh, and professional development over actually many decades uh, in ways that will become clearer uh, in my talk. Uh, but I wanted to start with a story that's really um, a bit of an entry into this long-term influence that John has had on my work. Uh, when I was a graduate student at Stanford, I would hang out at Xerox Park during the reign of JSB. And uh, I was working with a group who was doing research and development around uh, those text-based online worlds that were big in the early 90s, MUDs, MOOs. Sounds a lot like MOOCs, but they're not MOOCs. Uh, uh, but they were the equivalent of their time in a lot of ways. And I remember talking to one of my teammates, and I was, you know, I've always been interested in kids and gaming and play. And I was like, isn't it going to be cool when games get really networked on the internet? And then he looks at me, not critically, but just puzzled, and says, wait, isn't the internet for work? <laughs> And then I keep remembering that, not because I thought my colleague was short-sighted or critical, but because it was a reminder of the ways in which we all inhabit our own particular social and cultural milieu, where we have our own investments, our own identities, and the same technology, the same technology affordances can look like a very different opportunity space depending on who you hang out with, who your investment, where your investments are, uh, and what you see as the potential of the technology. Now, as I said, I've had the great pri privilege of coming of age intellectually and as a researcher within the context of institutions that JSB has built. This has included Xerox PARC and a particular orient orientation to social and technical research that was developed during a period that I was able to spend there. Uh, it includes the Institute for Research on Learning. Uh, where I did my dissertation work. Uh, it also includes the MacArthur Foundation's Dig Digital Media and Learning Initiative, which JSB was instrumental in kicking off as a board member and continues to advise. Um, I keep coming back to the book that John, JSB and Paul Duguid published in 2000, which really captured an insight that maybe a lot of us in this room take for granted now, because many of us work at the intersection of society and technology. But really, this idea about the inseparability of society and technology and the fact that the human dimension and the context institutions, structures, forms of differentiation that are pre-existing in our society and culture shape technology in particular ways, and that it's really important to attend to those uh, ways in which uh, technology and society are deeply intertwingled. Um, you know, this is the insight that continues to animate uh, a lot of good research, a lot of new interdisciplinary fields like you have represented here, whether it's information science or human computer interaction or science and technology studies. But I think what's important about John's work is not only the thought leadership, the crisp conceptual definition of the work, but also the fact that it's not just about the ideas, but about how you try to put those ideas in practice. So John is not only a thinker, but a technology maker, not only an interdisciplinary intellectual, but somebody who builds practices and institutions and who crosses boundaries. I know John jokingly calls himself a bumblebee or chief of confusion, but one of the things that I have aspired to, not necessarily as successfully as John is to be able to not only talk about the intermingling of these diverse spheres, but to actually cross them, bring them together, to dry, try to build institutions that embody that hybridity within the practice. And I think that's actually something that's happening extraordinarily well here. 
Uh, so I would like to take the opportunity of today's talk to talk a little bit about my own experiences and struggles in following in the footsteps of JSB in some small way. Um, and actually, the enormous challenge we face in putting this very crisp conceptual framework into practice. So we can say, oh look, society and technology are mutually constitutive, our institutions shape the form technologies take, but what do you do to build on those insights and to start moving the conversation forward in ways that are really uh, building off the values, um, progressive values that we might care to instantiate and the positive social values that we hope technology will embody for us. So I'd like to do this first by uh, framing a little bit of what I see as the problem space, some of the broader public debates around technology, education, and learning where I situate most of my work, uh, talk a little bit about the research and research findings and how that plays into those conversations, and then end by talking about the work that we've been doing as part of the MacArthur DML initiative in trying to bridge research and practice in order to um, you know, do this work of building new kinds of social and institutional formations. <clears throat> okay, so what's out there in the world? Uh, as some of these conversations, you've probably seen within the media, uh, you know, varying degrees of interest in questions about kids, about learning, about new technology, often young people at the forefront of these anxieties we have about how new technology is affecting society. So is Facebook making us lonely? Is Google making us stupid? Uh, now, there may be more proponents than detractors in this room. I'm not sure. I'm just making assumptions. But of course, the same happens in the uh, other side of the ledger. So not only is technology making us dumber, distracted, and lonely, it's also making us smarter, more democratic, more entrepreneurial, and a lot of good things, too. And this is um, a, a very familiar dynamic um, of polarization in the debates when a new technology is introduced. And I find that when young people get inserted into that conversation and when it starts intersecting with some deeply held values in our society around things like learning and literacy, there is a tendency for it to get polarized even more. And so this is certainly not new to social media, not new to digital culture, but is something that has accompanied the introduction of every new technology that young people have adopted in large numbers, whether it's the television, the PC, the multimedia CD-ROM. And I think um, to some extent we could get discouraged by this, but I think there's also an opportunity to some, uh, for some of us to help or think of trying to break this pattern. I mean, the, the problem with this is, is Google making us stupid? Is Facebook making us lonely? We're ascribing agency to technology, which gives us an opening to abdicate our own responsibility for shaping the uses of these technologies. So rhetorically, not only does it not leave an opening for intervention other than do you use it or not use it, right? Is it good or bad? Does it have a place in the classroom or does it not? But it also ignores the tremendous diversity of ways in which people take up technology and the fact that technology has uneven effects depending on the social lo location, uh, the stratification, the institutional context. It's like uh, Bill Gibson famously said, the future is here, it's just unevenly distributed. And a lot of these arguments ignore uh, the diversity of experience because of the assumption uh, underlying the discourse that technology has uh, uniform effects. So as JSB often says, the, the important thing is to ask the right questions. And the right question is not, is technology good or bad or learning, good, good or bad for learning, but really the question that I would like to ask is under what conditions, in what cultural contexts, what institutional configurations, when does technology have positive outcomes, negative outcomes, and specifically for whom? So the question then is what happens when new technology intersects with stratification, inequity, and the institutions, like our educational system, unfortunately, that produces inequity? 
Now for all of you who work in education, these kinds of numbers are not anything uh, new. Uh, so high school dropout rates in this country have hovered at about 30% for a while. Uh, for black, Latino, and Native American youth, that number is about 50%. Now, of course, there's tons of indicators of edu uh, educational stratification, so it's not that I intend to privilege this one in particular, but um, I think that when we talk about new technology without beginning first with stratification, um, when we're dealing with something like an entrenched institution like education, then it becomes very difficult to uh, get concrete and specific about the right kinds of designs and interventions. Um, and otherwise, the technology just becomes another technique that gets mobilized more effectively by privileged kids. So part of uh, what I think is important in framing the conversation, the questions, is to look at educational um, privilege uh, in terms of, in some ways, the existing institutions that stratify and sort and divide kids, uh, but also to start considering how the technology may start changing those dynamics of privilege and access in new ways. So um, my feeling is that more and more we're entering an era, and this is something John talks and uh, Doug talk about in their New Culture of Learning book, is we're entering an era when the kind of learning that really starts to matter is not just the getting good grades, going to a good school. Like college completion matters more than ever in traditional outcomes, but there's also this need for a more entrepreneurial, self-directed learner who really understands how to make use of the informal learning opportunities, the demand-driven ecosystem of information. Um, and that's what we're really finding in highly successful, what is sometimes called creative class kind of youth and careers, that there's this new learning dynamic that's emerging that isn't just about the formal achievement, but is about what I suspect many of us in this room do when we want to learn something new, which isn't necessarily to go take a class, but to go online, to connect to other people who have expertise, to understand an ecosystem and a flow of information um, and expertise in social relationships that enables us to learn something new that's demand-driven rather than uh, the, the banking model of education that Freire has uh, has uh, critiqued so effectively. So I want to take a quick body poll, uh, uh, take the temperature of those of you in this room, just in terms of your own feelings about uh, you know, the possibilities of uh, how internet is changing learning and research. So if you could show me with your thumbs, where thumbs up is it's totally like the online world, digital, social media has completely transformed the way I learn, access information, and do research. Where thumbs down is like it's actually made things worse. I'm distracted, I can't find anything, I'm overwhelmed with information. It's really just a negative effect on my learning and research. Where sideways is some good and some bad, um, definitely good things about it, but I really miss, you know, going to paper books and you know, other forms of learning and reflection that I think are, are more valuable. So where would you put yourself? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so generally positive, but a lot, a lot of sideways. So that's interesting, not so many thumbs down. Um, so I think what we have in this room is the new learning elite, right? So I think it's important to start thinking about educational and learning privilege as a hybrid that includes those traditional markers of privilege, but also is about the kind of uh, sort of what John has called the entrepreneurial learning that is happening in these highly tech leveraged ways. Um, the, the problem here, though, is that that kind of learning, that informal demand-driven learning, is not something that our public institutions of education are performing an equalizing function for. And this is where the equity thing starts becoming really, really important. So most of you have probably been aware of things like dropout rates. 
This is the kind of number that gets less play in the public discourse about learning and education because people tend not to look at the informal and out of school space. So in the period since the 70s, if you look at expenditures on enrichment activities, so the after school clubs, the violin lessons, whatever, it's tripled from 3,500 to, um, almost $9,000 per household in the upper quintile in this country. And for the lower quintile, it's basically stayed flat. So in an era when you see contracting opportunity for good jobs, heightened competition for traditional educational achievement, privileged families are going out of school to fuel uh, their learning and achievement edge. And the big fear I have is that the opportunities that are abundant and wonderful and accessible in terms of the digital and network learning are going to create an even wider wedge between those families who have the social and cultural capital to support those kinds of customized, individualized, empowered forms of learning and those who are largely dependent on our public infrastructures and aren't embedded in those networks of high tech social and cultural capital that can fuel the most um, amazing kinds of learning opportunity that the online uh, world uh, can really offer for young people. Um, so this is where I've been a strong advocate for looking at learning holistically from a learner-centered perspective and the ecology of learning rather than looking simply at our traditional metrics of success. Now what's interesting about our current historical moment is that we're seeing a growing equity gap in terms of opportunity, whether that's educational or economic opportunity in this country, at the same time that we're, we're, we've really seen a closing of what we've co traditionally considered the digital divide. So back you know, in the Xerox Park days, uh, the digital divide, when I was at Xerox Park, I don't mean to say that uh, it's past, but when I was in graduate school at Xerox Park, there was a lot of talk about the digital divide, uh, last mile for you know, access to the internet and things like that. And those, uh, there are still pockets where um, basic access is still problematic, but we've seen a real closing of a lot of those gaps. And teenagers have really led the adoption of um, you know, a lot of what we think of as sophisticated Web 2.0 social media like uses, um, you know, older generations have started to catch up. Uh, and, you know, gaming is obviously a, a gateway into a lot of digital and network practices, which are act, was, it sh is actually a lot more class and privilege agnostic than a lot of other technology forms. Uh, yeah, so virtually all teenagers play games, are on social media of some kind, and then. Um, Finally, even in this country, text messaging. When I moved back to the US from Japan in the late 90s, I was thinking, I don't know, are American teenagers ever going to start text messaging? Because the US was 10 years behind uh, Korea, Japan, and Northern Europe at that point. And then the switch flipped. And we, these are sort of the numbers that are kind of the stabilized numbers for the teen demographic for most post-industrial countries. 50 texts a day for boys, 100 texts a day for girls, something al along those lines. So these <clears throat> technologies have become basic infrastructure of social communication for teenagers these days, even at the same time that their uses for learning and education are still highly uh, um, diverse or stratified. So what we're finding today, our current situation, is that young people are highly engaged in social and recreational uses of new media. They have a lot of interests. They care about their peers. But there's a big engagement gap between where kids are and the kinds of opportunities that technology can offer in opening up doors to opportunity in their future adult lives whether that's academic achievement, civic and political engagement, or economic opportunity. And there is still a big gap, a generational gap, and a gap in our institutions, particularly our public serving institutions, in order to mediate that gap. Now, my problem with the concern about individual outcomes, whether that's distractibility or uh, loneliness, is not that those things aren't important, but they detract attention from what I think is the more pressing 
problem and set of questions we need to be asking for, the, the more pressing set of risks, which is the risk of a profound and growing equity gap between uh, those with educational privilege and those without. And this rarely makes it into the public conversation around technology and education. Now, <clears throat> what do we do about it as researchers, technology makers, um, progressive educators? So just to rewind a little bit to some of the work um, that Jeff mentioned that came out of the first round of funding of the then nascent Digital Media and Learning Initiative that MacArthur funded. Uh, so um, as Jeff mentioned, uh, together with uh, Peter Lyman and Michael Carter, um, I co-led a study with, uh, involving a large group of researchers that was really starting with uh, the basic question, so what are kids doing these days with new technology, specifically digital games, uh, social media, and digital media production tools, and how does that reflect their learning? And uh, specifically, we went to out-of-school context, uh, social and recreational uses of new media, because it was our intu intuition and continues to be so today that that is the site of greater engagement and innovation than what we were necessarily seeing in the formal <laughs> educational sector. Um, hopefully that's been changing rapidly, uh, but uh, you know it was it was and is still fairly unusual for educational research to be doing major studies of learning in the out of school sector. So this was um, a fairly bold move on the part of the foundation in a lot of ways, and I think was empowered by John uh, being part of the formulation of this new initiative. So what did we find? I won't go into all the findings, but um, the biggest goal of the work was really to start looking at the diversity of ways in which learning engagement was being impacted by the influx of these, these new technologies and young people's everyday lives. And it's very rare to have the opportunity to conduct a whole range of ethnographic cases with different populations and then look at them across settings. So as ethnographers, we're usually trained to go into context solo, do deep analysis, and then you know, maybe talk to our colleagues, but not really do analysis across them. And so what we did was a lot of the hard work of you know, arguing with each other about what we were seeing, how my kids were different from Dana's kids, were different from what Sarita was looking at. And so we had these great conversations about not just the depth we had in our individual cases, but how these kids were positioned in relation to each other. So I do the geeky kids, Dana does the popular kids. You know, we kind of argue about who's right about certain trends. And this is what helped us arrive at these categories, um, which we call genres of participation that differentiated how different kids, depending on their social and cultural locations, took up technologies in different ways. And there's a lot of distinctions we came up with, but the main one uh, has really been the distinction between uh, friendship-driven and interest-driven learning and participation, where friendship-driven participation is really about those mainstream sorts of peer social behaviors that you see that is ubiquitous in teen culture that center around popularity, status, uh, flirting, uh, looking good to your peers, and that is replicating a lot of the dynamics in the lunchroom, the locker room, um, at school, and when we were doing our research, it was MySpace and uh, Live, uh, MySpace and IM, and now it's Facebook and text messaging. So the platforms change, but the behaviors are incredibly resilient, and we're really a replication of these teen pressure cookers that we set up when we put young people in age-segregated contexts. Uh, and so this is uh, a site where we saw a lot of incredibly important learning dynamics around what it means to get together, uh, get along with your friends, to engage with your peers in public and semi-public spaces, to not irritate each other, to get a date. I mean, these are all really incredibly important things socially and developmentally. And along the way, because technology has become a ubiquitous part of these teen dynamics, they pick up how to create a homepage, how to mess around with HTML, how to modify digital media, how to publicize things on the internet, becomes just part of what we used to consider sophisticated technical skills, just is part of the ether of peer culture. And so it's important not to underestimate the importance of that form of learning that happens within these peer contexts. 
Now, a lot of my own work, though, uh, has really focused on the learning opportunity on the interest-driven side. So these are the behaviors that are really centered around young people pursuing an intellectual or creative or athletic interest that they have that is fairly specialized, uh, that isn't about popularity status and those kinds of things, but is about getting really good at something, geeking out with your friends. Um, often, not always, these are the kids who are at the margins of teen social status, so they're the uh, freaks, geeks, dorks, creative kids. Uh, you know, I'm sure some of us in this room have had these identity formations ourselves growing up. Uh, but often what happens is the local peer group who you get thrown into just by virtue of proximity and age isn't necessarily the peer group who you would intentionally choose based on identity and interest. And this is why specialized identities and interests often become marginalized unless you go to a school that's specialized or that's uh, defined as more of an intentional learning community rather than a given community. And there's obviously schools with different dynamics, but overall, um, the peer dynamics in a school tend not to be highly supportive of expertise-driven identities unless you happen to be really into football or cheerleading or something that has really high status in your peer culture or school. Now, these distinctions play on in online platforms. So when we were doing our research, it was MySpace for friendship, it was uh, LiveJournal for interest, today it is Facebook for friendship, and uh, Tumblr for interest. Now, of course, interest-based platforms are highly diverse. They're specialized to the interest, but uh, you know, the, again, it's like the underlying social dynamics, cultural distinctions, incredibly resilient, even as the technology, the platforms that are popular change pretty rapidly. Um, you know, and what's interesting about the online world and where we see the opportunity for interest-driven learning is that the online world changes the opportunity space in the interest-driven world in really fundamental ways, in ways that it doesn't change the friendship world quite so profoundly. So we saw this in early online communities that dealt with specialized identities, whether it was LGBT youth or it was youth with specialized interests, geeky youth that the internet became a lifeline to connecting with youth, interests and identities that you may not have had a critical mass within your local community. Now, this dynamic is scaling massively so that we have the opportunity suddenly for, to be able to connect with people regardless of whether we have those relationships available to us locally. Uh, and this is where the online world has the potential to make a tremendous difference to young people. Um, and often in our work, we did find cases of kids who you know, were managing all those peer dynamics within their local environment, but were also on World of Warcraft and was guild leaders on World of Warcraft, though none of their peers at school knew about it, were quiet, you know, football player who was secretly playing Sims on the side, and all, a lot of things were going on so that young people could start segmenting and being selective about their identity formations. So just to make it a little bit more concrete, I wanted to share a story about one young man I interviewed as part of uh, our digital use study. He was part of my anime fan case study. But he was a web comics creator, and he discovered web comics in the summer after his freshman year in college. He was at a rural, small college. All of his friends had gone away. He got online. He discovered a web comic that he loved and just read everything he could. He went, he was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. So he checked out web making for dummies, um, went on, took a lot of online tutorials and started making web pages and web comics. So the open ecosystem of the internet that has a lot of help forms, a lot of technical knowledge, was his entry point in being able to mess around with a new interest, a new technology, and gain exposure. Now, the thing that really fueled his learning into expertise, though, was the fact that he started connecting with other web comics creators on the internet, really finding a community online that supported his interests, his identity development. Eventually, he started hosting web comics and creating a site that aggregated web comics uh, for other artists. Uh, you can see he has advertising and was eventually making enough money from his site to support the site. And he actually started um, after school 
after he graduated from school, uh, making a living as a web developer. And he said that, you know, along the way, he tried changing majors several times to accommodate his interests, but none of his course offerings in school were actually preparing him for what he wanted to do, which was this. But he said, I really valued college because it was four years that I could just devote to learning web comics, which I learned on my own and with my community. And uh, so when I interviewed him, he was making a living as a web developer. By the time the book was published, he was actually making his living full time on web comics by selling merchandise related to his work. So he's an interesting case of a self-directed learner uh, you know, who was able to take that opportunity, that space of what you think of as your time in higher education to make a school to career transition, but did it in a very self-directed way that made use of not only the content resource, but also the community resources on the internet. And so when you look at Dave's uh, learning ecosystem, he started with a passionate interest that he discovered because of the internet. But then the way that he was able to get good at it was he took to the internet to develop a set of peer relationships that centered on his interests. Now he still hung out with his friends at college, so it wasn't as if he was socially isolated locally, but he had a new community that was highly tar targeted and specialized in what he was interested in. And what was interesting about Snafu Dave that made him different from almost every other young person we interviewed, although there were a handful of cases like him, is that he was able to connect the learning he was doing in the informal space, in the peer, social, and the interest-driven space, and make it relevant, not directly for his academic achievement, but certainly for economic opportunity. And it's very, very rare that kids are able to close that loop. Right? This is difficult because our institutions don't actually support the connections. Uh, but this is where we see the real opportunity space. So can we start thinking about drawing the connections between these sp spheres of learning now that we're seeing an explosion of opportunity in the interest and peer-driven space? And what would it take to start supporting the kind of learning that a highly activated and resourceful learner like Snafu Dave was achieving? And so we saw a few cases of kids who are really passionate, who are really resourceful, who are able to pull this all together. Most kids aren't like that. Most people aren't like that. We tend to require a little bit more supports, a few more invitations, institutional warrants in order to be able to build connections like this. And so the moral of the story is not that the internet creates kids like Snafu Dave, it's that it won't without much more principled, uh, well-directed kinds of educational interventions that really look at the opportunity space in new media in a way that is much more ecological and that attends to the whole learning ecosystem rather than um, starting only from this sphere of formal education. So uh, in the aftermath of the digital use study, um, by the time we finished, the Digital Media and Learning Initiative had become the centerpiece of MacArthur's funding in education. And we've had the great benefit of having a really interesting coalition of researchers and practitioners that we've been working in to build on some of the exploratory findings that came out of our work, uh, the work of Henry Jenkins in looking at new media literacies as some of the first uh, kinds of efforts out of the gate. Uh, we're involved in uh, sort of in the middle of a new round of empirical work that's looking not just at what young people are doing today already and they're out in the wilds of the internet, but saying how do you uh, take that learning and engagement and make it consequential for civic and political engagement, which is the goal of the Youth and Participatory Politics Research Network, and for academic outcomes, which is the focus of the Connected Learning Research Network that I lead. Um, <laughs> Now, a big question is, you know, given that we're doing research on how these dynamics work in online environments, uh, the distribution and equity issues in, in relation to opportunity, what is the role that technology can make? And we get asked this all the time, right? Does connected learning require technology? Uh, 
can technology make a difference? And I've just, I started by making an argument against technological determinism, but it's also really important to recognize and be smart about what it actually does help us do um, in terms of social change. And I think it's an interesting moment right now because suddenly the conversation around technology and education is really uh, center stage um, in a way that it hasn't been for a long time because of these MOOCs and new experiments in the online space. Uh, and I think uh, there's a, both an opportunity and risk inherent in existing incumbent institutions taking a very large interest in these kinds of opportunities for online content and learning. So I'm sort of curious, could I get a show of hands of how many people have taken an online course, not necessarily a MOOC, but any kind of online course. Wow, that's a lot of people. Wow, okay. Um, so how, okay, let's do another, since so many of you have, but for everybody, not just even if you've taken a course or not, how positive or negative do you feel about online courses in making a positive difference to education? Up or down? Oh, interesting. Okay, the room is really divided on this one. Huh. Well, that's a, it's a good indicator that there's openness in the conversation. <laughs> um, so we're really early in this conversation, right? So this is, you know, this is the community who needs to be engaged in it. So, um, and there's a lot of attention. So, you know, it, it's one of the, um, problems and opportunities we've been handed. Now, the MOOC thing isn't new, right? There's been online lessons and lectures for quite a while on the internet. It's just the big difference is that uh, it's Stanford and University of Michigan. And, you know, the, the, there's a big difference when the institutional actors uh, get into this. And now, I think what's interesting for me as somebody who's been sort of agitating at the margins of this kind of stuff for a while is not only just how the conversation changes when the you know, big boys enter the room, but also the focus on content delivery, right? Which is incredibly important, right? Like what's not to love about free and open learning content on the internet that's accessible um, and uh, you know, that is often uh, coming from elite institutions and really, really respected professionals in the field. Um, on the other hand, it's interesting how much more attention gets paid when the model replicates what people are familiar with in education. So I think the idea of lectures being online is something that is easy for people to understand, is easy for people to deliver, is an absolutely essential part of the online ecosystem, but is just one part of the ecosystem. So that's the risk, right? You don't want the silver bullet approach by thinking if you push content down pipes, learning will happen. But you need the content down pipes, so you certainly don't want to discourage that from happening. Now, Khan Academy is obviously the other site that's getting a lot of attention in this space in addition to the MOOCs. Um, again, what's not to love about uh, free content and this uh, guy who's really motivated by a spirit of public service, uh, which has been really, really impressive. I think since Khan Academy launched, the tech sector has really jumped on it as a solution to the problems in education. I think educators haven't been quite as enthusiastic, um, especially math teachers. Um, and they have rightly pointed out in a way that Khan himself has been very open to critique about, that it's not just content expertise, but it's actually pedagogical expertise that matters as well. And so a, a couple of math teachers did a mystery science theater type video critique of one of Khan's lessons. Uh, that got taken up quite a lot. Um, he actually changed his lessons based on the critique, but then a group of ed bloggers sponsored a video contest, a teacher video contest to do critiques of Khan's videos. And sort of the takeaway of one of the ed bloggers, Justin Reich, was that we were promised jetpacks and we got lectures, uh, which is a really good reminder of how early we are in the innovation cycle on this, and is certainly not to me meant to be a discouragement. But I think it's just a reminder that we have a lot of pieces to put together, um, and that just putting content out there uh, is not 
uh, is a starting point, but not the ultimate answer necessarily. Now, the other opportunity spaces around technology, social media, network media, and learning that I think get much less attention but deserve so much more attention are um, two aspects. One is self-expression, right? So we know that digital technologies have radically reduced the cost and accessibility of creating media stuff, content, and sharing it online. This is a learning space, right? So it's not just a sharey space, it's a learning space. And this is the piece that it's harder because it's not standardized content, we're not in control of it. But this is the kind of stuff that I've been really interested in studying when looking at kids' um, organic interest communities. And you're seeing platforms like Instructables that is really optimized for this kind of peer learning uh, and sharing. Uh, now, a lot of this stuff happens organically in online interest groups, um, but there are groups like Peer-to-Peer -peer University who are explicitly designing for peer learning kinds of dynamics in different areas of interest. Um, and then an, a, a, a genre of platform that I think doesn't get enough love and attention among educators is Q&A forums, which are just amazing. Like, isn't it amazing that now you can just go on the internet, ask a question, and somebody will answer it? It's, it's amazing. And why don't we wake up every morning and just be amazed by that? Um, and so, like Stack Overflow, which started as a geek Q&A site, has syndicated to all kinds of interest, including English language and usage. So every like form of geekdom has its online forum. And there are people who are really good at these things on the internet who give their expertise for free. And this is the kind of scalable capacity building that is a really sort of underappreciated resource in the technology and education conversations. And if we could connect those up to some of these bigger, more formal kinds of educational pl platforms uh, in ways that are not institution specific, but are about open, about capacity building, I think we have a ton of potential. Um, the other piece is, um, the diversification of interests that happens when you are um, looking at open and social. So it's not just that you have um, you know, the opportunity for individuals to share um, and create, but the fact that you're, you can proliferate niche communities and they can get more specialized, and suddenly you have an opportunity to reach diverse young people where they are, and it's not just like Stack Overflow started with the geeky coder communities, um, you know, white male geeky, you know, the traditional internet communities, but the internet's not just for geeks anymore. And so one of the case studies we've been looking at is Ravelry.com, which is a fiber arts community, where kids learn to do really hard things, like making a knitting pattern is really, really hard. And they're just an amazing uh, community that is sort of breaking some of the stereotypes of what an online interest group uh, is like now. Of course, we're looking at gaming and other forms of traditional geek interests as well. But um, you know, we're still seeing. I mean, there's still a divide here where, when we've pulled for interest, trying to find online groups that are instantiating a lot of these peer learning principles, they're still skewing towards sort of geeky male, you know, fairly privileged groups, and often groups and interests and identities that are more oriented towards non-dominant youth have less play, uh, girls' interests have less play. But we are in a space where there, it's opening up the possibility of even uh, non-dominant or tech-centered interests having more of a um, play in the space. And it's really about, again, diversifying pathways, growing capacity instead of this uh, bottleneck, winner-take-all, narrow pathway approach to uh, what the online world can offer for learning. Okay. So to return to uh, the connected learning model that I introduced with Snafu Dave, uh, this idea of the three spheres of learning, it's not just a descriptive model, but it really is uh, trying to sketch out the beginning of an approach to policy, technology deployment, partnership program design, a strategy that is cross-sector, um, which makes it incredibly, 
exciting, but also incredibly difficult because it forces us to do what JSB has done in his career is cross the public and private sectors, to cross institutional boundaries. We are working, like I don't know any other initiative that is working with um, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, Lady Gaga, and Team Liquid of StarCraft. You know, it's like, this is, it's about coalition building and finding the points of shared purpose across these sectors that don't traditionally work together, they, that may not always see themselves as education no entities. A lot of the tech sector, like I don't know that Google thinks of themselves as an educational education business, but they are in the business of education. They have the platform where more learning happens every day um, than anywhere else in a lot of ways. Uh, so it is a uniquely powerful approach, we believe, but also uh, very difficult to put into practice. Um, it's really about broadening the partnerships, the access points and pathways uh, so that young people from diverse walks of life, diverse interests can have not only entry points but ways of deepening um, and finding more social supports for their interests. So it's not just the math geek or the football star who has that experience of really having their identity and interest in learning supported, but um, kids with a much diverse, more diverse range. And so in our work, um, we really with connected learning, we really try to start with the values first because otherwise technology and educational techniques become techniques that become deployed first for privileged communities and lastly for less privileged and become a greater wedge. We know historically that's what happens with new technology, new educational affordances, is that far, even though it, it's not about intentionality, even if the intentionality of the innovators, the educators, is to create greater equity, if they become techniques that are divorced from a social values perspective, they don't really address some of the broader social social equity issues that a lot of us are concerned about. At the same time, we are trying to drill down into the design principles and technique layers. So what does it really look like when you have a high functioning connected learning environment? We're still really early in this work and we're really trying to develop cases, examples, design experiments. Um, if you look at our site, connectedlearning.tv, we're starting to curate some of these cases. We'd love to have more examples. We'd love to, we're trying to initiate a conversation about whether the model is right, what are examples of it, what are the challenges. Um, you know, one of the first sort of flagship examples we have is the UMedia site uh, where in uh, the main downtown library in Chicago, uh, the library gave uh, the MacArthur Foundation and Pearson an opportunity to rebuild 5,000 500 square feet in the first floor for a teen-centered uh, new media center. And they built it around a lot of our findings from the digital use study where they built a social space that young people were allowed to hang out, uh, bring food, play rock band, uh, and, but they were also able to connect with mentors and areas of expertise, take workshops, and really pursue geeked out interests uh, there was debate initially about whether they should move their teen stack into the space. They did. Uh, the librarians were thrilled that the circulation of the teen collection went up tenfold after the center opened. Uh, so this has been really fun. You walk into the space and you get the model right away. Uh, Katie Salen's Quest to Learn Schools, there's two open right now, middle schools, one in New York, one in Chicago, uh, school, middle schools based on a game-based pedagogy where all of the curriculum and state standards were organized um, around these quests where things like fractions and writing are, uh, are learned in a need-to-know basis while kids try to go through a fantasy narrative of like getting troggles off the island. By the way, you have to understand buoyancy and fractions and things like that. So games, not in literally electronic games, but a game-based pedagogy, meeting kids where they are, trying to start there and connect to academic subjects. And then a little experiment that I'm involved in more on the technology side. So like there's this feeling I have that for every learner, there is a teacher and an expert that can help them. And the internet should be able to help with that problem. So we're trying to do an experiment of um, matching 
uh, coaches, teachers, mentors, an area of interest with kids, um, and see if those sorts of relationships uh, could really help fuel kids' learning and expertise development. And it's amazing. There's obviously obvious reasons why this is a thorny area. Um, you know, introducing kids to strangers on the internet isn't going to win a lot of popularity contests and some of the rhetoric around this stuff. But when you really look at, you know, the issues of safety, what really has a transformative influence on young people's learning in an area of interest, being able to connect with a young person or a grown up who's a real, authentic hobbyist and expert in an area that a kid is passionate about is really, really transformative. And the internet is a lot safer than real life relationships in a lot of ways um, in terms of people being able to interact with each other around these sort of specialties. So that's just an area we're starting to experiment in. I'm sure, I know a lot of you are, are aware of our work with the Mozilla Foundation and their open badging infrastructure. So again, this idea that we need an infrastructure, new kinds of institutional configurations that enable that informal learning to become more consequential for the formal sector is badging um, and alternative credentialing, some sort of mechanism mechanism in order to help that happen. Okay, so those are just some examples of uh, the efforts we're making in trying to uh, really take that recognition that it's not just the technology, but it's a specific social context and infrastructures and institutional uh, innovations that are necessary for technology to have a positive transformative effect in education. Here's just some of the sites where we're trying to uh, build community, to share some of our learning on the research side. Uh, so I look forward to the conversation with all of you. And I think we have a little bit of time for Q&A, right? OK. <laughs> Are you seeing more social divisions? I mean, she really outlines the, the kids who were sort of those who bought into the structure and the culture, the adult sanctioned culture of the high school, and then the kids who opted out. Um, are, there, are you seeing more nuances? Is the internet giving kids more slices of life, more options about ways to be? Uh, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to, say in a generalized way, just because American high schools are so diverse uh, in terms of how that, uh, that dynamic plays out. I think what we're seeing that for geeks, it's making a difference, right? Because they have these outlets. Now, kids who are disenfranchised from the peer culture for other identities and interests, I don't know that the online world has particularly given them an outlet for that. So. You know, whether it's really broken that core dynamic of high school, I don't think so. But I think it has been a lifeline for certain minorities of, of young people. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, really, I liked your uh, example in the library setting of bringing the teen books into into the space where the kids were and the mm -hmm. youth skyrocketing. I was just curious if you had any other uh, examples uh, or experiences where uh, you've brought information, resources, physical or digital, closer to um, the, the kids uh, and seen that kind of growing use. Uh, so, you know, as you mentioned, you know, Google is a learning platform. Well, right. what about providing other, you know, easier access to other kind of resources, library, search systems, discovery services, to kind of get the use of those tools to, to increase as well? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. And I, I actually don't have a lot of examples of that being effective, but I actually think that's exactly the right design space and design questions. So, like, We've been in our sort of coaching matching platform. We've been trying to think of ways of, you know, it's really about capturing kids where their attention and social engagement is and then making visibility to these other opportunities for engaging with things. And so, like Facebook, kids list their interests, but it doesn't really help with the findability of other kids with those interests necessarily. So, 
um, you know, if your friend, if you're interested in skating and you post skating videos and things like that, sure, the kids you already know will know that you have a skating interest, but it's not as if the network recommends other kids or makes that visible. So those are the kinds of things that, from a design perspective, if you start thinking about, oh, what does it, what would it take design-wise to connect interests or peer behavior to start crossing those boundaries in ways that aren't intrusive, right? That's the other thing. You don't want those spaces to be colonizing each other. But um, some visibility, I think I'd be really curious if people actually have examples, because that's exactly the sort of thing we'd be interested in. I was wondering, do you see any evidence that this online community is finding ways to go and bridge the gap between people of different races or gender or social economic status? Or is, it, or is it just a tool to go and further divide us or a, a different tool that people can go and separate themselves into their own subgroups? Yeah, no, so I think that's a fantastic empirical question. And I think the answer is it depends on the group. So. Um, the what you know there are clearly interest groups that track along like socioeconomic racial or ethnic lines and there are groups that don't right and i don't think we really i mean there's sort of obvious things like groups that are highly have a highly racialized identity or something like that but you know even that it's not obvious so like you look at a genre like say hip hop which you think of as possibly having some racial or ethnic identity but it's one of the most globally and internationally successful sort of sub maybe you don't even call it a subculture genres that has you know taken over the youth world regardless of race or national location and similarly with something like anime which is of japanese origin like really like weird niche cult media it has suddenly become this sort of you know melting pot of international sort of reference in part because it speaks to like whether it's hip hop or whether it's anime it speaks to a shared sense of social justice or identity or feelings of marginalization that are incredibly resilient so i think certain subcultures that have a strong uh, and resonant values formation can really transcend um, you know that that more sort of narrow sort of identity politics. Um, so I think those are the things that are really interesting to look at. Even within the same culture, you see divisions that are more inclusive and less inclusive. And you know, but I think that's the interesting question. I mean, the other dynamic, not just like the racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic, is the intergenerational, which I didn't mention. Um, you know, with friendship-driven groupings, the intergenerational piece is just creepy, right? You don't want adults creeping on your Facebook. Um, but the, with interest groups, the intergenerational thing is actually a positive if you have adults who are authentic artists and hobbyists within the domain. So that becomes a point of intergenerational connection. So like if you're in a Warcraft guild or if you're in a music oriented interest, you know, and there's like a professional musician or a game designer, you know, that's, these are just heroes of the, these interest groups. And so that's where, you know, I think the interest space gives a lot more opportunity for bridging both, you know, traditional socio and cultural divides as well as intergenerational divides. of yesterday, could you say a little more about the ties with your work and the civic engagement of youth activity? Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's, um, we, we try to always talk about those three outcomes and we're not, I'm not always really good about keeping them in view, but because our really core to our model is the idea that the outcomes are collective as well as individual and that participation in a high functioning connected learning environment means contributing to a shared purpose whether that is you know and that could look like uh, you know like starcraft tournaments or it could look like a spoken word competition things that we don't think of as civic engagement but these are all spaces where young people are developing the capacity to contribute and participate in shared social formations. And we find that often there's this sort of developmental or capacity building effect 
of, you know, where, this is where Henry Jenkins' work um, has been really interesting, where he's been talking about the transition from cultural to po political participation. So you look at a, like, fan activists, for example, who get incredibly good through their fandom of organizing, self-organizing, communicating, advocating for their interests, of being, you know, caring passionately about something and not being afraid to step out. Um, and be out about an interest area that may not be super popular. And these are capacities that young people develop that we are seeing the translation from cultural participation to political participation. And in our survey work on the Youth and Participatory Politics Network, we're finding that young people who are highly engaged in participatory media are much more likely to be engaged in participatory politics. And so it's very important not to focus too much or exclusively on governmental forms of civic and political participation and to recognize that a lot of what we think of as, his, think, thought of historically as civic institutions like the bowling leagues or however you want to think about them are happening, you know, what kids actually have access to are these interest uh, driven communities and formation where they can actually exercise agency and mobilization and decision making. So I took online classes in high school, and uh -huh. it was because we didn't have teachers to teach all the classes that we needed to graduate. Um, so they were the more distance learning classes where you actually met with the teacher and with other people in the country or wherever uh -huh. who needed to take the same class. But yeah. it seems like now online classes are more, there's a professor offering a certain like course of content, and people just come who are interested. But I guess I'm wondering if, for the, the model of, you have all these group of people who are kind of interested in the same thing and all coming together. Is, is the way that online course infrastructure and trajectory is going supporting, like, you know, people collectively finding a person with expertise to, mm -hmm. you know, provide sort of structured content for them in that way? Do you think that's possible? So are you saying that it was demand-driven, like the way the courses were? Um, you mean if there's students, then you could make a bid for a course? Is that well, the mom? My question is, could it be? Oh, more? could it be? Right, right. And because with ours, yeah. it was the, we, we didn't have the teacher, but we already had the course that needed to be taught. So oh. they just kind of we used online classes uh -huh. to, to right, right to get a teacher. Yeah. But you know, could it be that you know there's a bunch of people interested in robotics, say, in yeah. high school, but there's no teacher who can yeah. teach that? Could they all get together? and go online to find you know, someone who could put together. Somebody program. should design that platform. You should design that platform. I love it. No, I think that's exactly the kind of thinking that you know, inverts the institutional-centered thinking of delivery. So the way that it's going right now is like, oh, well, we have a world-class expert on X. Let's build a course around them, versus there's actually demand for, you know, for your Mandarin at the college level, whatever it is, and that maybe there's a marketplace where that becomes visible and that you could actually start incentivizing people who teach based on demand and interest rather than simply expertise. Like that would be a really interesting model. And you know, I think that that kind of thinking of saying, you know, we are, if you're really thinking networked and open, then it shouldn't be about what um, JSB has called demand push, but also about supply pull. Um, and you know, I think that's the kind of innovation that could be really, really interesting. I don't know of um, platforms that can actually do that, except that there are a bunch of um, distance education or online that don't involve a live teacher at all, and those can be taken, you know, as many students whenever they want, but they don't have that social component that you're talking about. They tend to be self-paced and solitary. So if you could somehow get those two things working together, that would be, uh, I think that's a great opportunity space. Um, I'm interested in the examples that you show about uh, interest, uh, peer cultures, um, uh, in the comic uh, example. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just wondering uh, what could be the challenges for people to uh, create an online communities like that, mm -hmm. especially in many uh, different 
uh, domains. For example, in, in teacher education, teachers uh, don't have time, the connection is very limited. Do you yeah. have any idea about the challenges for? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there's so many challenges. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, like I said, we're really early in not formalizing, but getting a little bit more systematic about what it would take to support these. I think we're starting to see pieces of the ecosystem that people are getting good at. So like Q&A forums. We have a pretty robust sense of how that works. So there's no reason why you know, you couldn't deploy a Q&A forum in any area of expertise and have it pretty well optimized for car elevating karma and helpful behavior and things like that. We're getting better at content delivery, but not, we're not that good at it yet. Um, so I think there's still a lot of pieces that have to be worked out that um, before, you know, and usually how this happens is that there's a certain certain depth communities that optimize. So like it's kind of like with Stack Exchange, geeks spend a lot of time with something like that to really optimize some of the metrics and approaches, and then you start adapting it for other kinds of areas. Um, I think the professional development has features that are different from an interest-driven and voluntary type community. Um, and I'm actually less well-versed in professional learning communities, which, the, again, the incentive structures and reputation schemes are different when there's professional incentives attached to them. And you can't always rely on the same incentive structures as voluntary and hobby-oriented communities, which is a lot of what we look at. Um, but I think, again, it's sort of an emerging science of sort of the variables and metrics that you look at. So we, the, you know, the problem is like all of our metrics for learning um, and education were really optimized in a very different kind of ecosystem of, you know, where, you know, information was scarce, where institutional gatekeepers played a really strong role. And so we just, we don't even have very good metrics for what our targets should be of what it looks like when it's high functioning, much less you know, to really be effectively designing for it, which isn't to say that it's not going to happen. I just think there's a lot of work to do still. Um, I volunteer for 826 Michigan, which is a branch of a national organization that does tutoring, writing, writing workshops, all sorts of things for kids. Mm -hmm. um, in our tutoring center, we've sort of noticed incidentally that uh, when a tutor doesn't know how to do something, let's say the student comes in with geometry homework and the tutor's like, wow, it's been since eighth grade since I looked at this, um, it actually encourages learning more in the sense that the, yeah, yeah. the student helps the tutor then understand where they're at and then the tutor can kind of uh, piece together what they remember and what they're reading from the student's notes and book and whatever. Um, have you noticed that kind of trend or have you seen anything like that in the online communities where the expert doesn't necessarily know exactly what they can do to help? Right, right. Well, the things that's been really interesting, like we've been doing a coaching experiment for StarCraft where we're trying to get coaches to volunteer to help kids get good at StarCraft. And then initially, we did one-on-one -on -one matching so that you know we thought, oh, you have your own personal StarCraft expert who's going to help you. And then it turns out that they really wanted to do it in group contexts. So they wanted to be able to, because it's like just the idea that you're the expert and you're supposed to know everything. And so first the coaches started talking to each other. And they were like, well, how do you teach them this? Or do you use screencasts? Or do you do real-time coaching or whatever? So there was sort of this informal professional development that started. And then we, had a, we put together a Skype hangout for the coaches. And then it was like we started having Wednesday game nights where anybody could show up, and then they like to group coach each other. Because I think it's just that, that idea that expertise relies on individuals, and you know, that whole model, it's like we don't have to live in that world anymore. You know, when people are allowed to be dialogic and develop knowledge collectively, it's actually a lot more fun and a lot more learning happens. Thank you.